Welcome to another episode of our personal empowerment audio series, Finding Yourself in Paradise. I, I'm Michael Benner. And I'm Steve Snyder. And our program today is on the topic of influence. Whether we persuade or cajole, whether we threaten or entice, whether we push or pull, sometimes even reverse psychology is a methodology people use to get other people to do what it is they want them to do. A central tenet in personal development and human potential is the understanding that you can't rely on a need to control what's happening to you. You can't control other people. You could threaten them, put a gun to their heads. In many cases, that's not going to have any influence at all. And so the emphasis logically goes on controlling or managing what you do with what's done to you, your perception and response. Well, having said that, if we can't control other people, could we influence them? Of course we can't. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Given that you really can't control that authoritative, parental, you better do it or else, doesn't work in most cases. And even when it does, it extracts a horrible price in the long term. But influencing and persuading is about creating a real bond, a connection, something built on mutual respect and harmony and We're going to develop that idea today. Seduce, cajole, influence, persuade. There's lots of names for it, but I I think it's really a subtle art. Yeah, indeed. And sometimes it needs to be blatantly employed in a negative way. I mean, sometimes we need to say, for example, if you're working for a company, that if you don't perform at a certain level, you're going to get fired. That's sort of got to be there. So there's got to be some kind of a foundation that if you don't perform well, there's going to be negative ramifications for bad performance. But beyond that, I think most companies are understanding now in influencing their employees that it's the carrot that works way, way better than the stick. It's giving them opportunities to experience motivational, intrinsic rewards, giving them the opportunity to feel like they've done a really good job and get complimented for doing a really good job. It's pulling them, enticing them by showing them what could be, how great it can be. We have a mission with this company, and as we work together, we create this mission together, and we're part of this family that makes this thing happen. That kind of creating rapport, creating a common bond, creating a connection, and then pulling, I think is the most wonderful kind of influence. Sometimes we have to get behind somebody and push them, you know. Sometimes there's a necessity to motivate by saying if you don't perform, then there's the negative ramifications. But more often, and certainly first, you want to come with, if you do perform, here's the reward. Yeah, talk about getting the pony in front of the cart. This is <laughs> our ancestors long ago realized if you're going to use an animal, better to have them pull than push. There's a lot to be said for that. Now, I think it's important to understand that the more stressed we are, the more likely we are to see things as this or that, you or me, my way or the highway, that kind of stuff. You see that in politics a lot. It's not a very elegant or effective, not an efficient way of managing people. It's easy. It's the way most of us were parented. And I think a lot of us have had experiences with being managed that way in a business situation or setting. Steve already said there's got to be some degree of negative consequence if you don't perform, if you don't do well, if you just don't care, you don't try, you come to work late, so on and so forth. There has to be the negative consequence. But if you listen to any motivator, they'll tell you, about what Steve's described as the carrot instead of the stick, about pulling instead of pushing, about the you and me rather than the you or me, okay? That's rapport. That's creating a positive connection. That's saying you and I have a shared stake in the outcome here. This is real leadership, I think. Women and men who can create this bond, this human, heartfelt connection. It's not only the heart. The head has to be in there as well. It has to be reasonable and logical, the thought behind, the motive, why are we doing this, but then to to factor in, to add the caring part, 
That's the energy in motion, the emotion, if you will, is the dynamic of feeling, of let's do this together. The whole idea of teamwork, for example, in business and industry and school as well. You ever study in a team? It's a wonderful feeling. Or students often do really much better when they're a member of a team that is competing with another team not needing to beat them, just to do the best they can in that kind of teamwork environment, all pulling together. You know, there's a lot to that. We mentioned animals, the horse pulling the cart. Well, imagine 20-mule team Borax getting all those mules to feel the harness and pull at the same time in the same direction and experience each other. There's a lot to that. That's not an accident. You know, there is a lead mule that is in charge of all those other mules, and all those other mules follow that one leader in, in, a, in a large mule team like that. And that's probably dog sleds, the same kind of it's thing. Lead dog. They have and to if make If you're not it... the lead dog, the view never changes. <laughs> <laughs> They've got to make a decision to work together, and so do we. Yeah, and that's a real key to influence is to create the togetherness, to the we are on the same side of the table, not on opposite sides of the table. We're on the same team. We're not on opposing teams. That's the rapport that we're talking about. Really, the key to influence are really like three different aspects of influence. One is like, what are you trying to influence them to do or be or have or believe? or exp- that It's the content part of influence, like, you know, believe the way I be, vote the way I vote, buy what I'm selling, that kind of influence. But then there's also the message, the vehicle that brings that. It's the words that you say or the pictures on television or, or whatever it is that delivers the message in, in a way that is supposed to be influential. But ultimately, I think the most important what it comes down to is, Who's the person delivering the message? Are they credible? Are you influenced by their authority? Is it somebody you look up to or believe in or trust or feel connected to? The wrong person delivering the right message doesn't sell it. It's only the right person delivering the right message. So like who you are and creating connection to the people that you're expressing to. This is where famous people have, you know, a lot of power. People in their living rooms who have never really met this movie star, or this television or this this professional sports guy, but they feel like they know him because they've been following him for a decade and they're their friends in their own mind. And, and so when they say you should buy this thing or they say you should believe this thing, it has a lot of credibility to them. Or... The most powerful is when it's somebody you actually do know that you really look up to and admire and trust and has created that rapport with you. Now, sometimes that just happens. Two people come together and they have this thing, this connection. This uh, There's a, a Spanish word, simpatico. I don't think there's any English equivalents quite as good. It's like we feel like we're on the same wavelength. We're brothers under the, you know, it's, we, that feeling sometimes just naturally happens as, in fact, it did with you and me some several decades ago. But it can be nurtured it can be created that you can actually anybody can help create that feeling with anybody else it only takes really one person's intention to create rapport between two people if that one person can go where that other person is if the person who wants to create rapport with somebody else behaves like becomes like sort of acts like the person that they want to be with so they feel a connection so they feel like they're speaking my language. They're on my wavelength. They get me. You know, this is a safe person because this is definitely an us, not a them. And so we do that by creating a familiarity, a sense of rapport comes from often being on the same wavelength with the way we think, like visual people connect better with visual people, auditory people with auditory people, kinesthetic people with kinesthetic people. So if I'm a visual and I want to connect with a kinesthetic, I can just behave more kinesthetically, which means... I'll slow down my speech and I'll take some deep breaths and I'll start talking about my feelings and and what I understand and and what makes sense to me. And and all of a sudden, the person who I'm with, when I was talking like this, that that doesn't feel like me. That doesn't feel safe. But now I'm talking like this. Oh, okay. This person gets me. So there's a lot we can do to create a connection, a, a simpatico, a rapport. I think the law of attraction, the idea that you reap only what you sow, that what goes around comes around, you have to give away the very thing that you want to receive, 
is real important in relationships. In other words, if you want a connection with somebody, you have to give something that you'd like to get back. In other words, if you want credibility, you have to offer that. Let's call it respect, for example. The best way to earn someone's respect, and I didn't say just receive, but actually earn their respect, is to give them evidence that you respect them. If you want people to be interested in what you're saying, it's really a good idea to initiate obvious interest in what they're saying. Be a really good listener. Ask questions. This is something that natural leaders understand and many other people are reticent to adopt for some reason. I'm not sure why that is. The lack of awareness or even resistance to asking questions. Maybe it's a fear that you look stupid or something, but I'm not talking about those kinds of questions. I'm talking about questions that reveal that you're truly interested in other people. This was <laughs> years and years ago. This was the big secret in Dale Carnegie and Norman Vincent Peale. They both said, be genuinely interested in other people. Don't feign it or fake it. Be sincerely interested in other people, in what they think, in how they feel, in why they feel and think and behave the way they do. And if you give that away, guess what? You're going to get that back. It's automatic. That's how you begin to create rapport. You care about other people and they begin to care about you. Love is too big a word and it's overused to say you need to love other people, like love your enemy. What if that simply meant to show a genuine interest in why they're your enemy? I mean, not to be afraid of them, but to really want to understand your enemy. And as you understand them, they become less and less threatening to you. It doesn't mean hugs, that love your enemy stuff is still challenging to a lot of people, because their idea of love is only emotional or romantic. The idea that it's peace and understanding, that it comes from uh, slow, deep breathing, feeling safe, and really wanting to understand, to be interested, to ask questions. That's how you begin to create rapport. You give that away, you're going to get that back in return. Yeah, I mean, love thy neighbor really could be said be at peace with your neighbor. It really is easier to say it that way and understand what it really means. It, it means don't be afraid. It, it, it means don't make them afraid of you is really what it's all about. And that may be the first step in creating rapport and creating being influential. Unless you're going to use the, the stick, unless you're going to use the negative, threatening kind of influence, which, you know, there is a place for. But generally speaking, the first thing you want to do is make sure that they feel safe with you and that you are expressing that you are safe to be with and therefore you're not threatening and therefore you're not angry and, and you're coming from a place of calm quiet a sense of peace a, a core sense of it's okay everything's good you know let's start from here uh let's let's see where we can go together so creating rapport creating the situation where you want to be able to influence people. It happens everywhere in your life. I mean, whether or not you're in sales, uh, you're on the other side of it, you're buying stuff. And, and when you're buying stuff, we're watching television, and they're trying to influence you to buy what they want you to buy. You know, they do it a lot with the negative side, you know, they do it a lot with uh, you aren't okay, unless you have this product. But they also do it with the positive side, like, look how great you'll be if you have this product. So either way, they're attempting to influence you, they're attempting to get you to do do what they want you to do. And they study this. I mean, this is something that's been really deeply researched. And, and we know what it takes to get people to do for the most part. I mean, there'll always be exceptions, but we know how to get enough people to do what it is we want them to do through marketing, through advertising, through branding, through commercial methodologies of getting people to see what you have and make them feel either inadequate without it, or have the fantasy of being more adequate with it. Many years ago, I did a keynote address, a motivational speech for a big water company in Southern California, and uh, I had to do an hour and a half, so I sort of snuck up on my big point, and that was this axiom that you can lead a horse to water, 
but you can't make them drink. And I played that out as long as I could before I brought up the little-known option or alternative that you could make the horse thirsty. You don't hear that. You hear people say you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Yeah, you can. Why do you think they have salted nuts on the bar down at the corner? And they're free, right? You don't have to be Einstein to figure out that's going to make you thirsty and you're going to buy more beer or whatever. So you can motivate with the carrot better than the stick. Steve's right. Sometimes you have to show the stick. It has to be there. But... In and the most, stick doesn't mean literally physical violence. No, no, no. You know, I'm just saying. It means the, the, you know, the negative ramifications. Exactly. Mm-hmm. But the carrot and the stick is the saying. And so you can't force the horse to drink, but you could make the horse thirsty. That's what we're talking about. That's at the core of creating rapport and influencing other people. Not necessarily if they disagree and now you've made them do a 180 or caused them to abandon their position and now they're in total agreement with you. What if they just acknowledge that you have a point? What's the best way to do that? I've already suggested it. Acknowledge their point. Understand that instead of all differences being opposites, which is rarely the case, although that's the way the human mind tends to work. Especially when stressed. There you go. You took that right off off the tip of my brain. Particularly when stressed, we tend to see all permutations as opposites, any variation, any difference. Like a married couple, they might agree on 99%, and yet that 1% can get exaggerated into this opposition Or you forget the other 99 and get all worked up. Again, what if you give what it is you want to receive? I think that's real leadership. Give that acknowledgement of their position. Say, I don't really agree with you, but I can see how you'd feel that way. You know, I'm not sure that you and I are on the same page here, but I can understand how you'd arrive at that position. That makes sense to me. What's the cost? That's so intelligent. Now you've made it safe for them to return in kind. This is what rapport is. And this is a way to begin to influence people. Now they're open to your argument. If you can get acknowledgement, you're halfway to agreement. You don't really need to go for agreement right out of the gate. How about just some interest and a little bit of acknowledgement? Give that and you're likely to receive it. One of the most obvious places we use influence is in sales. So let's talk about how do you sell something to somebody, and that's essentially how do you influence them to choose to buy. So let's say I'm a used car salesman, and I'm standing on the car lot, and a customer walks up. How do I know what approach to take with that person? Well, the one thing I can find out pretty quickly is, as I mentioned earlier, whether they're experiencing the world primarily as visual or auditory or kinesthetic. And how, how can I do that? Well, it's really quite simple. All I need to know is the different traits they have. But visual people talk really fast and they use lots of hand gestures and they look up and they breathe shallow and they blurt stuff out a lot. Whereas auditory people love the sound of their voice and speak evenly with those FM DJ mellifluous kinds of tones, looking to the sides for their information. Who is he talking about? <laughs> no, I don't know. Who can I be talking about? Um, and then kinesthetics, you know, they're really deliberate and they speak slowly and they never, ever blurt. You know, they well think everything out. They look down. So when somebody comes onto the car lot as a salesperson, if I say, hey, welcome, what brings you here today? If they're a visual person, they'll look up. And tell me what they saw that influenced them to come here. They'll say, well, I saw this ad on television, or I saw my neighbor bought a new car like this. So they'll look up and and get a picture in their mind of what it is they saw. If you ask an auditory and and you say, what brings you here today? The auditory will look toward the side, toward their ears, and tell you what they heard. They say, well, my neighbor told me about, or I was listening to the radio, and I heard. And if you ask a kinesthetic, say, what brings you here today? Kinesthetic will pause, think about it, look down, and tell you, just feels like it's time to get a new car. So 
you, you get a sense right away. If they talk fast and they look up and they talk about what they saw, they're visual. If they talk evenly and look to the side and tell you about what they heard, they're auditory. And if they look down and get in touch with what they're coming from inside of them that motivated them to do it, then they're probably being kinesthetic. It really doesn't matter if that's what they always are. All that matters is that's what they're being right now. And that's the connection you need to make right then. So if it's a visual person and they're talking really fast to me, then I'll talk really fast back to them and I'll point out cars and, and show them the car, have them look at the car and come inside and look at that wraparound steering wheel and, and look at that beautiful emerald green color. And, and what, what do you think the neighbors will think when they see you drive home in a car like this and you get them to picture themselves in the car? See, the key is if you get a, to get a visual to buy something, you want to get them to see themselves owning it. So you have them imagine themselves in the car, and when it comes time to sell the car to a visual, because visual people are impulsive, you just close hard. You just say, buy the car now. You know, just, you want the green one and you want the blue one. You know, it's like not even choice. The visual people don't get buyer's remorse. They just want to, they hate shopping. They just want to buy the thing. They just want to get it. You know, they want to get it. They want to own it. So they just go. So you just sell it to them. But with an auditory, you can't do that. When an auditory comes on, you've got to, like, listen to them. You've got to ask questions and let them do the talking and let them talk themselves into the car. And also, you want to let them hear the car. You know, you want to turn on the radio, 17 speaker separation. Have you ever heard Beethoven in 17 And the you know, throaty roar. And, you, you, and you, what do you think the neighbors will say when they hear that you bought a car like this? And you get them to imagine themselves having conversations. But mostly, you get them to talk about what a wonderful car and what a wonderful time they would have if they had this car. Now... When it comes time to close a sale with a auditory, you can't just say, oh, you buy the car. You can't push them because then they feel, oh, no, he's, you know, he's trying to pull one over. I better go shop around. So with an auditory, you've got to make them feel safe. You've got to say something like, if you buy this car now and see uh, the same car for less money in the next month, I'll, I'll make the difference up to you. Or, or go shop around and, and find the best price, and I'll beat that price. If the auditory knows that they aren't going to get taken, that they're going to get their best price, then they'll be willing to buy. But if they don't know that, they're going to go shop around. They don't love shopping. They don't hate it like visuals do, but they don't love it, but they're willing to do it. But with a kinesthetic, it's a completely different story. Here's somebody who has done all the research. They have done the due diligence. They've been on every website. They've been to a dozen car lots already. They've, they've looked and looked. They've, they've studied it. They've researched it. And, and they come onto the car lot. What you want to do is just say, I'm over here if you need anything. You know, don't even encroach on them. And they'll be the ones that open the hood and kick the tires and check. And then they'll come over to you and ask you, if you're the salesperson, they'll ask you questions like, uh, what's the compression ratio of the cylinders on this? You know, the really technical stuff to make sure you know what you're talking about. And when it comes time to close the sale with the kinesthetic, Aesthetic, you don't even bother because they don't want to buy a car. They want to make sure that the best they get the best car. They they're gonna if if you if a kinesthetic buys a car and finds the same car for a lower price later, they'll kill themselves. You know, it's like they feel like they're they've, they've ruined their life. So what happens with a kinesthetic is they put off buying a car. They put it off, put it off. They just keep putting off, looking for a better bargain. And one day their current car falls apart. It just falls apart, and they need a new car. Then they'll go back to the salesperson that bothered them the least. Because they hate intrusive, pushy, pushy salespeople. So if you were the one that said, I'm over here, if you need anything, you just answered their questions and you didn't try and push them to close, then they feel safe with you and they'll come back. So with a visual, get them to see the car and close hard. With an auditory, get them to hear about it and close soft. And with a kinesthetic, let them go. They'll come back when they really are ready. Now you might say, well, I'm not a car salesman, so why are they telling me this? Well, because everybody is selling something. Maybe you're selling yourself, like in a job interview or maybe on a romantic date. You want to put your best foot forward. You want to sell yourself. Matching those representational systems, matching those rep systems is a wonderful way to create rapport. Also, to help you understand why you're attracted to the kind of people that you're attracted to. So whether it's a date, maybe a job interview, or any other situation, we sell ourselves, right? Then there's the idea of selling an idea to a spouse or to a boss or to a parent or to a child. Again, influencing and persuading people is best done when you create a good, warm, honest positive and sincere, heartfelt connection with another person. And so to be aware of these rep systems, the visual, the auditory, and the kinesthetic, is really smart. 
Everybody's all three, but the vast majority of people favor one over the other. Steve said everything except rich Corinthian leather. That's for the kinesthetic <laughs> yes, in each of us, right? But he's right about the way it sounds. I remember going to a motorcycle convention, and although you weren't supposed to start the bike, somebody started up a Harley in the middle of this meeting, and everybody just freaked because part of what it means to be somebody that owns or really likes Harley Davidson is that blah, 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 and the sound that that motorcycle makes. That's the whole thing for auditories who like to ride big bikes. This information isn't just for salespeople, obviously, because, again, maybe not quite the right word to say everybody's selling something. But we are social creatures. We have other people in our lives, in our romantic relationships. We all have relationships with our parents of some sort, and in most cases, they could be improved, not only for their best interest, but for yours as well. To get along with other people, to understand other people— this is really smart. This comes out of a field called neuro-linguistic programming and was really rooted in psychology and the hypnosis work of a fellow named Milton Erickson in the 1940s and 50s and 60s. Ericksonian hypnosis led to neuro-linguistic programming, or NLP, and the idea that you can tell if a person is largely, primarily visual, auditory, or kinesthetic, and then by matching that rep system, as Steve described, you're going to have much more rapport. Another part of this is also matching their overall attitude, their body position, their body language. In other words, mirroring somebody. Successful women and men do this automatically, may not even know that they're mirroring the other person, and the other person, unless they're really conscious, is not likely to recognize that the reason they feel so comfortable in the presence of you is that you're mirroring their body language. You act a lot like them, so if suddenly they sit back and open their arms— you take a moment, sit back, and open your arms. If they move forward and fold their arms over their chest and become sort of closed, you may want to do that same thing. But once you connect, you stop following and begin leading. In other words, if their arms are closed and they're being sort of defensive and you want to open them up, create that connection, mirror them, and now you initiate a new behavior. You open your arms, breathe a little more slowly, right? Get the person to relax. Why? Because they get smarter when they relax. They're more likely to understand where you're really coming from. And if you're in your integrity, if you're telling the truth, if you're really sincere, if as a salesperson you really believe it's in their interest, to purchase your product or your service, it's so much easier to do. And when we're saying mirroring, we're not really saying mimicking. It's not like do exactly what they do. It's just, if you think about it, if, if two people are in a meeting sitting, sitting together and one's like, you know, kicked back in the chair and the other's like leaning forward in the chair, neither one of them is going to feel that comfortable in that scenario. It's the person who's leaned back, the person who's feel like there's an aggressive guy coming at them, and the person who's going forward is like, come, come, you know, come be here. You're like, you're, you're not here. It doesn't feel like we're in the same place. So that creates a dissonance. That creates a, we're not in the same place. Thing. So we're not talking about doing exactly what they're doing, but certainly be aware of the fact if you're doing exactly the opposite of what they're doing, you know, you're going to make them very uncomfortable. So do more of what they're doing. One of the easiest and best and most powerful is matching their breathing. It's just to get, just notice when they're taking an inhale and, you know, get that same rhythm that they've got going. That'll create, you almost be at the same speed now. You'll be talking probably at the same speed. You'll be moving at the same speed. And then, of course, you can breathe even a little deeper, and then they'll follow along. Once the connection is made, then, as you said, Michael, you go from following into slightly leading in the direction that you want to lead. 
So creating that through matching and mirroring. Uh, breathing's a good one. Another good one is if, if a person is like uh, got a rhythm, you know, they're, they're tapping their finger or they're tapping their toe or they're, you know, they've got a rhythm going, you know, well, match the rhythm. Just, you know, move like they move, you know, uh, and not, again, not mimicking, not like trying to do an impersonation of them. Just get in the same flow, get in the same speed. You're not trying to be them. You're just trying to be less unlike them. Did you ever see that routine with Lucio Ball and Harpo Marx? Oh, yes. <laughs> in the mirror? Yes. Where they're actually exactly. literally... <laughs> <laughs> it was like the Patty Duke show in the early days. You know, It was the same girl, but it looked they were pretending to be cousins. It's yeah. just a general... Mm. If it's not mimicking, it's more of an attitude. Rapport is like a countenance. Simpatico, we're back to that word. There's not a whole lot of words to explain it, but it is a feeling that's designed to help the other person feel safe and relaxed and interesting. If you're interested in them, they're going to be interested in you. And again, if we can get off the general or you or me, the adversarial relationship works in certain situations, but now we're back to the stick. The and, you and me, doesn't mean we have to agree on everything. It's like harmony in music. If we all sang exactly the same note, that's nice. It'd sound like a children's choir. But if you want to sound like the Beach Boys or the Four Tops, you've got to sing different notes, but still be harmonious. It's not just any different note. There are different notes and different rhythms, but they're still designed to be harmonious. So is your behavior discordant or is it harmonious? Is it you or me when it could be you and me? Not perfect alignment, not unity. Just harmony. Between unity and separation, between and and or, is we can get along. <laughs> this middle ground of harmony, this is the carrot. This is very smart. This is rapport. Yeah, I mean, it goes back as far as philosophy goes back. It's got lots of names. I guess the golden rule is probably the most well-known name. And the golden rule is a wonderful technology for dealing with people you don't know. If if you want to get connected, if you want to feel safe and make somebody else feel safe, then do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Be If you want people to be nice to you, you be nice to them. But, but you know, when, when you deal with close relationships, intimate relationships, that breaks down because it's really not do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. It's do unto others as they would have you do unto them. I think it was Tony Alessandro who called that the platinum rule. The idea is don't give people what you need. Give them what they need. If you know them well enough to know what they need, give them what they need. And that's really one of the most important keys to being influential is if people feel like you're supplying them with what they need, if you feel like you're a source for them to look to to get the things they need, the information they need or the support they need or whatever it is they need, we become more influential. We draw people by giving, not taking. We provide them a service. We do nice for them. We be a friend. We be friend. We be a friend, and then they become friends back. It doesn't start the other way around. You don't become influential by asking people to do stuff for you. You become influential by creating the ledger balanced on your end. You know, you've given more than you've taken. Give a little bit more, take a little bit less, and then and then all of a sudden it feels like here's a person that absolutely doesn't feel taken by you. It doesn't feel like used by you. They feel like enriched by you and, and powerfully, positively influenced by you. And then they see you as somebody worthy of their respect. You must respect somebody to get the respect back. And it makes a whole lot of sense if you think about it because – if I'm showing you how much I respect you by giving you all this stuff, thinking you're worthy and valuable and I want to give you all this stuff, if I'm saying I respect you with my behavior, then clearly you're more likely to respect me because, well, gosh, I must be cool because I respect you, right? I mean, like what good taste I have. I respect you. I mean, I, I think the kind of person that I want to respect is the person who respects me. They've proven to me they've got, like, good taste. So give and then be willing to receive because that's the way the universe works. Yeah, there's no harvest if you haven't sown a crop. You've obviously got to sow in order to reap. And yet, you see people are creating these impossible conditions, like in a grudge. Well, I'll forgive them if they apologize to me first. And what's the other one saying? 
you know, the Hatfields and the McCoys goes on for years and decades and centuries. This crazy attitude of, no, you go, well, that's giving your power away. Now your whole life depends upon something somebody else does. And you wonder why you're powerless. You gave your power to them. They control the situation if you need them to initiate the behavior, don't you see? But if you take responsibility and don't confuse it with self-blame, to be responsible is not to blame yourself necessarily for what happens to you. It's the ability to choose a response responsibility. And now you've empowered yourself. I will choose my outlook, my attitude, and I will choose my response. Instead of the knee-jerk reaction, I'm going to initiate a response. That's very empowering. It's a choice people make to be influential to a certain degree or not. Some people like don't want to show their power. They just want to like hide their their abilities. But there are other people who, who say, no, I, I want to go make a difference. I want to change the world. I want to be influential. And for both Michael and I, that was a very early decision we made in our lives. We're, you know, we're not going to hide. We're going to get out there in front of people and, and talk about the things that matter to us. And, and for me, I consider myself to be a very influential person. And I think it's primarily because I've had this idea inside my mind all my life virtually that I want to help other people make their dreams come true. That's one of my favorite things in the world is to help other people make their dreams come true. And people like that about me. You know, it's like, that's a nice quality you've got there, Steve, making, helping me make my dreams come true. So it's not about, you know, I want you to help me make my dreams come true. Although that is a result of it, but it's not about that. I'm not thinking about how can you, what can you do for me? I'm not thinking about that really. I'm thinking about what can I do for you? And in, in doing it that, of course, I've received so much. My life is so incredibly blessed. I mean, karma works, you know, the law of cause and effects really does work. What you put out, does come back, but you want to focus on the putting out part. You want to focus on, on the giving the real secret to influence, to being influential is to be perceived as A, safe, and B, generous. We can say about this that you really have to like other people. Well, what does it mean to like other people? What is the most important component, or better said, prerequisite, to liking people in general, to just like humanity? It's to like yourself. And what does it take to like yourself? Well, you have to know yourself. You have to understand who you are. And the more you understand about who you are, the more you like who you are. But not in an egotistical sense. This is the higher self that begins to lose a sense of separation. Here's that and versus or again. You start seeing your interest and the community interest or the interest of the greater good, the group, the whole family that is humanity, as being aligned, generally speaking, not in every respect, but generally, we all want the same kinds of things. We want to be loved. We want people to be interested in us. We want to laugh and have fun. We want hugs. We want to be around like-minded people. We want to share our bounty. Human beings are much more alike than they are different. Now, the differences are beautiful. It's very important. The diversity among men and women, that every one of us is unique, is an incredible thing. We've got fingerprint evidence and DNA proof of our uniqueness. But having acknowledged that, We still want the same kinds of things. You need to really like who you are and accept the higher self you find in paradise. Isn't that the name of this whole series? Finding the truth of yourself, finding yourself, capital S, in paradise. In fact, I think it's a good time to go to paradise to do an audio journey. Yes, indeed. What we're trying to do when we want to make people more open to our influence is to make them more suggestible to us. We want them to uh, have a state 
be in a state where they don't reject what we say, they accept what we say, and they accept it with greater intensity. And, and that's what paradise is. The alpha brainwave state, when we move out of the multitasking divided attention beta brainwave state into this focused passion alpha brainwave state, what happens is we become more suggestible. That's what hypnotists do, is they help people become more suggestible. So that when you give them a suggestion, they say yes, they say yes. I mean, yes becomes a big, big, big yes. It amplifies the power of suggestion. Uh, one of my earliest teachers, uh, John Kappas, who ran the Hypnosis Motivation Institute, said that uh, when someone is in that state, the power of suggestion is amplified eight to 800 times. Eight, that would mean you'd have to say something to somebody at least eight and maybe even up to 800 times to have the power of saying it once to them in the state of totally paying attention to only that. See, when you're divided attention and, and your mind's all over the place, everything comes in and scattered. It, it doesn't have the influence. But when it's your laser-beamed mind on that one thing, then that, that thing is the only thing that becomes much more powerful. So that's what happens when you go to paradise. Everything else goes away. You, you fixate your mind in a state of focused passion and create this state of hyper-suggestibility. So the most important person in your universe you need to influence is you. And this is the place to do it. So take a deep breath. Always starts with that. Let's your brain know you're safe. Take a deep breath or two. Get comfortable in your chair or wherever you are. And another deep breath. Hold at the peak. And now as you release, find your center and feel the peace. All the tension does release. Virtually all the anxiety inside of you does cease. And you're free of the confusion, clear and at peace. Create and sense a letting go feeling from head to toe. You may even wish to scan your body slowly with your awareness. Move from your head, where most of us tend to reside, down into the body and feel the way relaxation feels. Remind yourself how it feels to be safe. to be unhurried, free from any concern at all about what time it is or what day it is, forgetting the past even if for only ten minutes or so, releasing any concern about the future and just sitting right here. Ah, right now, so safe and so wonderfully relaxed. And in this quiet place of peace, feeling safe and clear, feeling confident and positive and free of any fear, Begin to feel how it feels to be influential. Just the core of that feeling, the essential. That people care what you say. They want to know what you think. They feel with you a kind of special link. Feel like you are influential. And know that you influence with integrity, that you do it with love and concern. And the respect that you have because you've given it away is respect that you truly have earned. Imagine yourself more influential, people waiting to find out what you know. And imagine that you use your powerful influence to help people that come to you grow. 
feel that feeling. Feel it strong. Feel influential. And as you move along, as you give the respect, you give the care, you're the first person that says, I'll share. Then you'll find what's essential and will become influential. When you plant a seed, tap down the dirt gently, sprinkle it with your watering can. You don't need immediate evidence that it will sprout and grow. In fact, maybe you scattered seed knowing that some of it may not grow. But if you scatter enough seed, most of them will take root and begin to sprout without your influence or control. So the influence is to plant the seed. And so it is with people. You don't need to order people or command people. There may be a time for that. But to offer a suggestion, to plant a seed without any evidence that they agree, that's real leadership. If you have a belief in your principles and you have faith in your concept to communicate them clearly, then it often is enough to just plant a seed in someone's mind to presume they'll begin to care about it and it will be nourished by the heart and sprout and grow reaching deep into the earth and at the same time coming up toward the sky, looking for the sun, for the source of life itself. And you're long gone. Like Johnny Appleseed, you've already moved on down the road. Plant the seed and take some satisfaction in knowing that that's enough. Plant the seed. That's all you need. The influence is there. Now perhaps it's up to the sun and the wind and the air. But sometimes you can help. You can add a little water or shade or you could make it a little easier for the changes to be made. So be influential when it's appropriate and allow yourself to be influenced too by those things that are positive and life-affirming, those things that are good for you. Allow yourself to be more influenced by those things that are in your best interest to do. Allow the influence of others to be even more powerful over you when they're the right people and you know it. It's true that the rapport is there and you feel it and you knew that this was the person that you wanted to trust. And it didn't feel like you should. It, it feels like you must. It feels like it's right. It's true. It's the way. Allow yourself to be influenced by people who say those things you most need to hear, the ones that make you feel safe and remove all your fear. Listen. And allow yourself to be inspired. Allow yourself to be influenced. And allow that to fire your passion. And in that fashion, you'll create what you choose. Allow yourself to be influenced. It's a powerful tool for you to use. Bring this awareness of giving that you might receive and create a connection to be as influential in a positive, kind, intelligent, heartfelt way 
as much as possible, bring that attitude with you effortlessly. As you remember the room in which you sit, take a nice, slow, deep breath, fill your lungs, hold for a moment. And now, as you exhale, uh, open your eyes wide awake, alert, rested, and refreshed, back in the room, feeling better than before. You know, I used a phrase in the guided imagery, uh, influencing with integrity, which is actually a wonderful book. Maybe the best easy book on the subject of neuro-linguistic programming and on creating rapport and all that. It's old. I mean, it's probably from the 70s, I'm thinking. But Jeannie Laborde is the author, Influencing with Integrity. I really think it was the first book that I read on NLP that wasn't written for like a therapist, that wasn't written. Bandler and Grinder, the the developers of it, really, uh, their books, Frogs into Princes, and, and those kinds of books were really about pretty clinical, whereas Jeannie Laborde's book was really more like how to run a meeting or how to sell something. or it was, it was pretty good stuff. Influencing is a very important part of life and being influenced so that, you know, you're not alone. You, you get to be inspired. You get to be motivated. You get to be filled with passion by sharing a dream with other people as well. So open yourself up to being more and more influenced by the right people and more and more influential to the ones you need to be. That's a real good point. I'm glad you made that. that part of being able to influence other people is understanding why they have influence over you. Indeed. Yeah. So understanding, yeah, again, we come back to that word. That's such a rich and wonderful concept. Beyond knowledge, understanding, really grokking it. There, we'll go back to the 70s. To the 60s, I That's think. That's the 60s. <laughs> Stranger to strange that, Robert Heinlein. Really grok it. Hey, thanks for being with us. Join us next week as we continue our Finding Yourself in Paradise Personal Empowerment Series. As always, be gentle, love life, and take care of each other. For Steve Snyder, this is Michael Benner. Aloha from Maui. <laughs>